Hello and welcome. My name is Danielle Ofri, Editor-in-Chief for the Bellevue Literary Review, and we're pleased to welcome you to Reading the Body. Hi, my name is Paige Fraser. I am co-founder of the Paige Fraser Foundation. Uh, I helped to produce this film, and I also danced in this film. We're excited that we have four wonderful dancers who have created original works based on the poems of Deborah Golub, Ona Gritz, George Looney, and Melissa Stein, four poets published in the BLR, the Bellevue Literary Review, uh, thinking about disability, art, and poetry. So enjoy, and we'll see you after the show. Think that you have smoke in your stomach. Buteau choreographer. Wood smoke, something arboreal. Think your lungs a forest cleared, your breath winged as if it had a better place to go, or just discovered that all this time, the outside door to the basement has been unbolted, and here you are. Think your body an amulet on the doorpost. The body is still loyal to the marriage although it seems at times to want to run away with someone younger or hopes that giving you so much trouble, you'll be the first to leave. Think a water spout up the spine, your head just ahead. Think that the official envelope you'll prop unopened against the farthest wall of the living room and will stare so long at doesn't contain paper served or a notice of eviction. It's a love letter as if you're young again. Mud between toes, toads underfoot, all of you hopping as if you were happy. As if you were happy. shoulder. I sense weight, but no warmth. Your cheek to my right touch, stubble free, whether or not you shave. Under my right fingers, your silver hair holds no silk, nor can I feel it part into single strands. A 
tell you how I know you in the dark. Left whispers the details. Right listens and believes. The sky this evening's a bruise. Too often, in trying to hold the world, we harm it. Given that, I still want these gulls not to give up their chorus of sound that add to the music the sky hums, an aria no human throat could mimic. I want to read the bramble of the tree's bare branches like any other text, all language a longing for what's being said that can't ever be said. Any other day, I might give up and swallow every sound I could utter, not today, the wind in cahoots with what I want, what I need to believe. Tonight, this battered sky will hum a lullaby. You, you opened this door, forced it back on its hinges, drove in the thin wedge saying, I may need to enter at a moment's notice. But don't you know that metal, metal, Metal has memory, memory alive. 
the way rising dough resists a probing finger or trodden grass springs up against the foot's imprint. Even flesh that retains the rare bloom of a bruise soon lets go. You keep these iron plates apart so long they rust apart flaking into the slightest breeze and still they remember what it means to rest against each other, folded like wings. You opened this door, forced it back on its hinges, drove in the thin wedge saying, I may need to enter at a moment's notice, but don't you know, don't you know, don't you know that metal, metal, metal has memory, memory alive, the way rising dough resists a probing finger or trodden grass springs up against a foot's imprint, even flesh that retains the rare bloom of a bruise soon lets go. You keep these iron plates apart so long they rust apart, flaking into the slightest breeze. And still, they remember what it means to rest against each other, folded like wings. Um, I'd like to start by asking um, if each of you could talk a little bit about um, yourself and maybe how disability impacts your art. Um, I began as a writer um, and my practice as an artist was to, yeah, to, with text. And so it was really exciting to think about mm. how to combine text with dance and think through texture um, and poetics through movement. Um, I'm a disabled artist uh, and dancer primarily. And um, I think my work uh, sits very directly into my diagnos diagnostic history, um, hemiplasia, cerebral palsy. I was diagnosed with hemiplasia, cerebral palsy when I was three months old. And um, that really, serves as a lens as to how I think about movement and think of and have and have a relationship to uh, my own body. So my movement will oscillate, vacillate between abandonment and interiority or, you know, light and dark. There's this real, you know, I'm, I'm always thinking about the bisections uh, in my work. And so it, it narrates kind of uh, beautifully to what I was originally diagnosed with. So that's how it usually puts up in my work. Yeah. Q, would you like to uh, step in? Absolutely, and also thank you so much, Danielle, for having me here. It is a pleasure to be sharing the stage with all three of you, Paige and Jaron. Um, my, my disability, it's really a, a, a medium, another outlet for me to share uh, what has become my life mission ever since entering this world of a person with a disability, this disability community. I was not born with a disability. I, I acquired my disability downhill mountain biking after I sustained a spinal cord injury that rendered me paralyzed. And, and, and that mission that I that I allude to is really showcasing that we're all so much uh, capable of so much more than we know. And, and for a person with a visible disability like mm -hmm. 
you know, my, my day job, I'm a policymaker. I'm a government official. I help run the largest transportation network in the United States. And, and that's fun and amazing. But, but really, a kid doesn't know how exciting that is. A kid just sees that I work behind a desk. When I dance, when I move, mm. they see me as what they would call normal. They see me smiling. They see me showcasing my art in, in what society has expressed to them is nor normative. And, and, and that's why I say my, my, my art is another medium for me to showcase all that I'm capable of doing and, and reminding that small child that's viewing the piece that they too are capable of so much more than they know. Yeah, thank you. And, and Paige, why don't you share with us a little bit about yourself? Yes. Uh, so I was diagnosed with scoliosis at the age of 13. Um, and it really came out of nowhere for me. I was dancing since the age of four. So then to see your spine, see this x-ray, it's like, whoa, when did this happen? What caused it? Um, a lot of questions, a lot of frustrations. And for me, I always knew I wanted to be a dancer. It was something that I just like had the desire from a very young age. So I think that passion is what kept me focused and allowed me to see the other side of that diagnosis and how I was feeling as a teenager in high school. Um, I went to performing art high school, so we were all kind of different in our own way. And I think that also definitely helped with me just stepping more into it and accepting it um, and not allowing it to limit me, although it does create limitations within my body. Um, seeing it more as a superpower it's like okay i now like have like way more awareness than the average person in my alignment and there's way more attention to detail and i think that's what has carried me forward as a dancer is is the attention to detail and the drive to really understand my body and and figure out pathways that feel better for me um and there's patience with that as well. And I think all of those things I bring into my dancing and my chore choreographic process. And that's definitely what you saw in my portion of um, the presentation is just a reaction to not only the poetry, but the music, and then also taking time to kind of figure out in my body which way it wanted to move. It's really nice doing pieces like this and, and projects like this where there's no pressure to have like a final product. It's exploration um, and just honesty in that way because it's not about it being pretty and, and perfect. And I love that I am imperfect because of my scoliosis. And I love that more people now are like really speaking up about the physical challenges they have and not allowing it to hold them back in any way. Um, and that was what was so beautiful about this project to me is each dancer is so different, different backgrounds. Um, as Q just said, like he works behind a desk, but it's like we all gravitate towards the art of movement. And I definitely believe movement is healing. Um, and it's a beautiful way to just communicate how important it is to embrace everyone um, as different and unique as they are. Yeah, and I'll say when you talk about imperfections, you know, at my day job, I'm a primary care doctor at Bellevue, and I have patients who have all sorts of limitations, some we would call disabilities, some not. Uh, and actually, one of my long term patients uh, also was um, in a wheelchair from a spinal cord injury at a young age. She's now much older, but she's always used a manual wheelchair. And I once asked her about that because, you know, electric wheelchair is easier. And she said to me, if you don't use it, you lose it. And she looks at it as her her power. And I found it just a, a, a phenomenal lesson. Um, I, I do want to introduce um, uh, Salim Hugh Penny, who's joining us. And and Salim is the narrator of our uh, film. And, and Salim is a poet who, in fact, won the BLR Poetry Prize, the first place for 2021. <laughs> and uh, so we're very thrilled to have him here. And Salim, maybe you can tell us a bit about yourself. We're talking a bit about how disability affects our art and our work. Um, hi, my name is Salim. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and friend. 
And uh, a little bit about myself. Um, as mentioned, I am a, a poet, although with the um, often ever-present threat of, uh, of uh, imposter syndrome, sometimes it's hard to, to note the thing that I very much am at my core. Um, so yes, a poet and um, very much somebody who is constantly trying to understand how my multiple identities um, intersect and ways that I can, particularly for young people of color, that I can um, highlight uh, those other uh, often un, un, um, underestimated potential um, that they have and the many multiple complex ways that they can also shine. Thanks. And I was and Paige began to talk about the experience of the solo and each of the solos were quite different in the movie. And, and maybe, um, Jaron, you could talk a little bit about how you approached your solo with the poem that you read and your choices of movement. Sure. Um, I was really interested in um, ritual in the sense of like how um, <laughs> our context in our houses and in our uh, our spaces don't necessarily lend themselves to like beautiful artistic you know products, um, and so I wanted to uh, think about the minutia and the, the the smallness of some like around the, the environment um, that I was in. Which so I, I I was I was focusing on my the relationship to the couch and to rest and to a sense of. Um, a sense of architecture between the space of like, you know, the blank space and how my arm might extend or what, how the movement might reveal something that, that is like behind the words um, uh, of the poem. So there was, I think I was, I was playing with like what was mundane, what was spectacular. Mm -hmm and then what was um, already on my body and kind of natural. Thank you. And, and Q, how did you approach your solo and with your poem and its choice of movements? So, so my poem became a, a very personal to me. Um, after my own injury, I, I lived at an institution for 10 months in rehab. And, and you know, not another procedure was something very dear to me and, and front of mind quite often. And, and you know, the, the words in the poem really translated visually and, and, and through my body in, in the extraction of mind and thought from the physical space and really trying to go inward to to leave the surrounding and, and to leave the situation, to leave that thought of, of another procedure, of another uh, uh, um, tool invading me, my space, or, or another tool defining who I am. And, and the best way that I did that was by going inside, by going inwards. And and Salim, you actually read these four poems that were not your poems, but they touched on some aspects of disability. I thought maybe you could comment a little bit on, on the poems and how they resonated with you. Sure. Um, I thought it was fascinating um, and always revealing to see sort of what each, each uh, artist selected and without knowing people and sort of that being my introduction of like, hmm, okay, they picked this poem, you know, I wonder what what why that sort of thing was is really neat and then to see uh, most of folks choreography before i read was also informative but it was equally exciting to read some of the poems and not to have seen the choreography and then to be curious of sort of how those are those are going to process is going to come together um i was really excited that the range of ability and disability and the sort of celebration and mourning and loss and all of those seem to come in um, play out equally across the pieces, um, even though they were across a range of, of, of abilities and disabilities and limitations. I liked how each piece sort of pushed back on its environment. Um, and so sort of um, it was very clear that there was all these pieces were very dynamic, which is why I, it was fun to read them. Also a challenge because I was really thinking through some of these are very painful, you know, you're, you're talking about loss or about um, a spouse or a significant other trying to touch you and, and maybe them not feeling part of you, you know, so, so very, very painful things, um, but also things that deserve to be celebrated uh, as our bodies do um, deserve to be celebrated every day, especially bodies that are not um, 
perhaps meant to be surviving or bodies that are definitely not meant to be thriving. Um, it's even more important to celebrate. So I wanted to try to bring that celebration um, to each of the readings in spite of the weight or the gravity that might have uh, been present in the poem. Yeah, um, thank you. And, and Paige is really the driving creative force behind this whole project. And and so Paige, you come to this from, from the dance side and you and Salim had quite a long ongoing communication about how to sort of connect these two art forms. And maybe you can share with us what sort of the process of thinking about how to do words on the page and that's, that's sort of very, in some ways, one dimensional with a three dimensional form that it stands. How did you see those things coming together? Um, I really wanted it to read as one book with different chapters. And that idea came to me way after, after seeing everyone's solos and, mm -hmm. and seeing which order made most sense. But in terms of my personal process with Celine, uh, we had a conversation, but then when I went into the studio, my process as I tapped into earlier, it was very fragmented. I found myself doing something and then stopping and then doing something else and then stopping and nothing was wrong with that it then just inspired like the flow of my solo and the vignette style editing and all of that so um Salim was extremely open and was able to then see what i produced and 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 see where i was going with with my narrative there and just the use of repetition and uh, we played around with like certain words being repeated and having this process be so open um, and allowing myself to just accept what came naturally out of my body um, versus like being so strict and like, okay, this is what I want. And this is when I, on count seven, eight, there was none of that. It was a really mm -hmm. open, natural process, which I think as dancers and artists, we a lot of times long for that. I know with, with me being in several dance companies and, and musical theater shows, it's very like, this is the step, this is the count. If you don't stand here on this count, you may get hit by something. So it's nice, again, during this pandemic to have the space to um, explore different pathways. Um, and of course, I look at I look at things and I'm like, oh, I wish I had done that a little differently. But um, giving myself grace and accepting what naturally just came out of my body in response to the poetry um, and also the music. And a couple of years ago, BLR had a special issue on disability, which we entitled Abilities and Disabilities, the Range of Human Function. Because, you know, it's really, it's all a spectrum. We all have, everyone's got limitations somewhere along the line at different points in our life. And, and you know, when we think about the pandemic, for many artists, this became a, another limitation uh, on their art, you know, one that we hadn't planned on, and of course no one plans on any disability to begin with. Would any of you want to just comment on how the sort of the pandemic, you know, was that a disability for your art? How, how did that affect your art? Um, I actually think that um, the pandemic revealed a sect of creativity that disabled people have been doing, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Say what people have been in their homes and been in their beds and been in, uh, in other spaces and still creating art. So there was a actually an egalitarian moment that happened where other like non-disabled people and people without disabilities were catching up to a kind of framework and a kind of uh, response to productivity that um, I think that was really particular and, and known in the disability community already. I I agree, absolutely agree with Jaron. I, I saw a lot of my friends turning to folks with disabilities to say, hey, this isn't new to you. How, how do you do this? Or how do you cope? With this? Or how have you been coping with this all your life? And, and, and that was awesome. For me personally, my art is so collaborative and, and I, I really feed off you know, input from others, I, I feed of the energy that I share when I'm creating art, and, and, and that's lacking, still is. And, and I think I've taken a big toll. My art has taken a big toll. I would agree with that, Q. I, I do miss the energy mm. of an audience. It doesn't need to be thousands of people, but I miss that exchange um, and that feeling before you step on stage where it's like, the adrenaline, I guess, um, 
But I, I do see the beauty of this moment for me, at least. Jerron mentioned rest, um, something that I definitely um, needed and I needed to understand what it really meant. Mm -hmm. um, and it, the pandemic really forced me to slow down and take care of my body. I've been a professional dancer for 10 years. And before that, I've been dancing since the age of four. So this pandemic really allowed me to just like take a to scan and take a look at like what I've been neglecting um, by being in go mode all the time. Yeah, there's actually a wonderful piece in the Times, you know, focusing on the dancer's body and how many dancers have gained a few pounds during the pandemic, which maybe put them back at a normal weight instead of an underweight mm. weight and sort of, you know, rethinking did what, what we were doing before, was that normal or was that somehow were we disabling our bodies by creating them in a way that that, that isn't quite normal? Celine, did the pandemic affect your art in any way? Um, it has, um, but I, it, I say this slightly jokingly, but I sometimes worry that after the pandemic, I'm not going to remember how to have a conversation with a person face-to-face. Mm -hmm. -face. Mm -hmm. And as a writer and as an introvert, um, at yeah. times it's been like, wow, finally y'all understand what it's like to be Zoom <laughs> fatigued. Like this is literally what it's like every day being in an office. You know, I feel like there have been, been moments where because the expectations are not to be out there and to be, you know, in front of a in front of a, an audience, it's let me go so much more interior. And I feel like I have not been this productive with my poetry in in years, honestly. Yeah. Well, for one thing I found interesting, you know, for for BLR, for our literary magazine, you know, before the pandemic, we had two readings a year, you know, in-person poetry, prose readings, and they were lovely. But once we couldn't, we moved online, we began having other events, something like this that we never would have done before. And we've had, in fact, more collaborative events with different organizations than we've ever had before. I think we've done eight or 10 events uh, already this year in ways that we couldn't have. And so I think um, by forcing us to, to move out of what we were normally doing, we found other things that, and, and now we have audiences, you know, tune in from all over the country, all over the world. And, and that's been a fascinating thing. And so I, I, you know, I'm hoping, and I think foresee that we'll keep some of that as we go back to, you know, we're all anxious for for real life again. I mean, I mean, the one thing for those of us in the hospitals that we never stayed home, you know, we, I, I went to work every single day, the whole time. So that, that part didn't change, which, although the, the nature of the work changed, the, the routine didn't change. It was a very, odd thing to to sort of look around everyone else was home and that was the dominant theme but all of my colleagues and friends were coming to work every day you know a, as we always had but i think we really we miss the interaction outside of that you know it's one thing to work together it's another thing to to be together and i think the lack of of arts when i was a resident training at bellevue was during the hiv epidemic and um i was uh decided i want to take a dance class and my only criteria was it has to be only one bus or subway from Bellevue. I can't, I'm too tired to do a transfer. And so I opened the phone book because there's phone books in those days. And there was really only one dance company and it was Martha Graham, which was straight up first Avenue. But, All right, I'll show up. And it turned out to be my saving grace. And I spent my whole residency going pretty much every day straight from the hospital wow. to the Graham studio. Mm -hmm. and, and it was some of the most powerful moments of having a chance to, um, to actually introvert into the body it, whereas the hospitals is this chaotic place and, and, and there's so much happening, focusing on dance and music was very much um, a homing in. And, and that, that sort of opposite temperament was so meaningful. And, and I realized that we don't have that now in this pandemic. We know none of us have that kind of outlet. Um, the thing I want to turn to now, and maybe Q, you could lead us off. A lot of people who, who you know, work with disability in some way find themselves segueing into advocacy kind of whether you like it or not. Um, and, you know, I think it brings up mixed mixed issues. Is that is that a um, something that you enjoy doing or something that feels like it's a, an onus put upon you? Maybe you could talk a bit about advocacy in your life and, and, and where that's taken you. Thank you for that question, you know, so much. For me, that, that question really hits home because my entree into the advocacy world started right at rehab. You know, I, I was at Rusk, and because my injury took place when I was 18, I, I was able to choose whether I wanted to go to pediatrics or adult, and I chose pediatric. I just figured it was more fun. And I became an advocate in that ward. 
you know, yelling and fighting with attendees and doctors, telling them things like, listen, you're talking to a five-year-old, I get it, but they have something to say. Like, mm-hmm. and over what they're saying or not pay attention because they're, they're a child and they don't have a parent here to stand up for them. And I would get into really heated debates with doctors. Um, ultimately, the doctors would come around and say, hey, Q, can you help us out with this patient? They to us, but we know they'll listen to you. Um, but for so many other people, particularly person, non-disabled people, I, I really think that once you're exposed to this world of disability and you learn how vast it is and, and how it touches every part of life, it's impossible not to. Uh, um, and, and I say that because, you know, the, the, the world of disability has has shifted recently from this paradigm, this ethos of nothing about us without us to nothing without us, period. Because persons with disabilities are ubiquitous, indeed in every part of conversation. Every conversation is a disability conversation. Because there's a person with a disability, whether you know it or not, in that orbit. And, and, and we do ourselves such a disservice when we omit, when we do not speak up, and when we don't let others know that this too is a conversation about disability. Because what we do today crafts the path for what happens tomorrow. Growing up, I was so interested in being that maverick, being that independent person who, um, would be able to, you know, hobnob with elites and be an award-winning artist without, you know, identity politics. And um, it wasn't until I, I became in community or was in community with disabled people that I like kind of, I understood a little bit more, um, maybe a collectivist or a community action um, ethos, um, which led me to understand, like I, I always found advocacy very incongruous with like my artistry, like I thought of it as like, that's the job. And then I, my artistry would, would fail or crumble or would just be in service to the other, right? And so I think how I remixed that was, um, I just put it in my art. I just made my art critical and, and understood in ways that could answer the questions, the nuance that I was I was seeing about what I deal with on a daily basis or what, my friends go through what kind of um, legacies or scholarship that I'm viewing or or reading about. And the needle moving forward is in the actions of stuff. I knew of one other, no, I'm lying. I knew two other people who had scoliosis within my orbit. Um, but in terms of like professionals that were on the main stages at that moment, I didn't know of any. Um, and again, this I was in high school right when like, the internet was a thing for us and like Mm. Facebook and MySpace. So Mm. we didn't have social media to just like type it in like scoliosis, Mm. dances with scoliosis. Now that is there, you know, and I think it's beautiful that we now have these organizations like the Paige Mm. Fraser Foundation, like Scoliosis Curvy Girls, like Straightforward Foundation that is making their mission and vision clear to raise awareness about this condition um, because it can be very isolating. And when I was training and and just all the challenges I did have to work through, I felt like I was working much harder than the average dancer in the classroom um, to keep my rib down, to keep my hips square in a ballet class. And it's like, now I'm 30, I'm like, my body does what it does. It does it differently. Yes, I'm still able to accomplish the task, but it's a different route. Um, Salim, has has advocacy played a role in your life? How sometimes you can come out with advocacy direct front and center in your job title. Sometimes it's in the work. Sometimes it's both. What what does quiet rage look like? Or, you know, what does is, what is a whisper shout look like? Or what is the way that I can, you know, speak the most truth? Um, and, and have it hopefully reach the, the biggest platform you know possible. Oh, thank you. Um, Samantha, maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, and how you came to this project. Yes, hello. My name is Samantha Figgins. I'm originally from Washington, D.C. I currently live in New York City, dancing with uh, Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. I am a hard of hearing deaf dancer. If I came into contact or just uh, came together with Paige and we bonded in our own 
shared experiences dealing with disability. And so I'm Nina Shavzad Zebrin. I'm a third year medical student right now at NYU. Um, in my past life, I was definitely heavily in the in the dance world, um, trained as I'm sure all of you did um, very rigorously um, through college, and then kind of stepped aside for a number of personal reasons, but wanted to keep dance in my life. Um, as I progressed through my training and practice of medicine. And I was able to secure a um, medical humanities fellowship to work on a project um, that basically was a paper and then also a syllabus for a course at NYU um, that laid the foundations for using dance as a vehicle to teach um, medical providers more about their own bodies and themselves in hopes of um, enhancing communication with patients. And Paige, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you use dance in teaching, both for dancers and, and you know, quote, non-dancers. Through the foundation, we, we created Dance is Healing, which is a program that creates a safe space for dancers with or without physical challenges. And I think it was really important to develop that program. So both sides of the spectrum was in the same space. For the public, thinking about a dancer having disability often seems like an odd idea. Dancers seem to have you know, perfection in, in, in everything physically. And, and tell us a bit about your life and how that played a role, if at all, in your dance career. It played a major role in my dance career. The illusion of perfection <laughs> um, is something that any dancer with or without a challenge ability has to face in their life. Um, and for me, I was always just feeling as though I was catching up and behind. Um, so I spent a lot of time in my off time outside of our class schedules, outside of class rehearsals. I would be in the studio all the time drilling myself, just drilling, drilling. A little bit of um, self-deprecating, just um, pounding in the pavement to get it right so that I can feel as though I'm on the same page on the same level, equal with my other uh, peers, coworkers even. Um, so it's still honestly a challenge up to the present day for any dancer, just releasing that illusion of perfection and accepting the flaws and the, the struggle that you have because we all have a struggle. And if we don't share that, share how from the struggle, we find our triumph then we can, we don't have a a, a a a meeting place for growth. The whole pandemic has sort of brought everyone to um, some appreciation of what it might feel like to lose some of your typical abilities, not that we, in, in, in different ways, things we're used to having suddenly aren't, aren't there for us. Um, and Nina, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you see the role of movement in training healthcare workers. I mean, we've all had a front row view of healthcare workers this whole year. They've you know, become quite prominent in our public um, imagination and discussion, you know, how does this play a role? Where do you see it? When you have a, when you're able to explore kind of a vulnerable place um, in a dance setting, that's a very special thing because it's not often something that dancers want to do, but also that's not something that medical professionals typically do either. I think there's actually a connection there where, um, you know, in, in medical training, there's also this illusion of perfection where you know everything and you, you're getting all the questions right and everything like that. And so being able to explore um, vulnerability in yourself, if you're someone who isn't a trained dancer um, and starting to kind of uh, know your body, know the way you move, know how you express emotions yourself, um, that's something that can go a long way. And that's something that actually in my research, I came across as one of the reasons why dance might not have been incorporated into the medical humanities to date, um, because it is something that's um, more personal and uh, you're really putting yourself out there versus something like reading and writing that you can kind of keep to yourself if you want to. Um, another place that I thought was really interesting um, where dance might have a role in training medical professionals is the exploration actually of the safe exploration of um, and respectful exploration of what it might be like to have various um, kind of challenges physically that others don't have. Um, and I and I make this kind of connection, um, I, I believe, in my paper where, you know, if you're writing um, and you want to do a creative writing exercise, um, you might limit yourself to, let's say, you know, five words per sentence or something like that. And that gives you creativity um, and forces you to think in new ways. Um, and in dance, you know, you can explore maybe not having the use of your the right side of your body 
in a combination or in some improvisation. Um, and that would allow you to feel what that might feel like for someone else, but in an artistic, creative, respectful way, um, because that would be really hard to explore or embody in other, any other way when other people really do struggle with that. And I, and I mentioned earlier that I, during my trainings, spent my, my evenings after residency at, at Martha Graham, and I would come back and, and think a lot about, you know, how our bodies are in space. And we deal with a lot of bodies, you know, every day, all day, we're touching bodies, looking at imperfections, perfections, how the body is held, how it fails us in, in, in many ways. And um, I mean, not to mention that the hallways of Bellevue at night is the most amazing dance space, these big, long, you know, 60 foot hallways with no one there. And you can do quite a bit with that without freaking any, anyone out. Um, Paige, I wanted to ask you, you've had a lot of contact with medical professionals over the years. And I'm wondering, you know, if you have any thoughts about that, that either impact dance or you think some of the things cross over, you know, what, what can you share with us? Definitely when I was diagnosed and what that surgeon said to me, it kind of like, it always stayed with me and it was part of why I wanted to be vocal about my process because there isn't one way. I think, especially with scoliosis, that it's so complex. There's many ways to treat it. Um, and I really, during my research, found it important to pick the brains of others with scoliosis, but also to talk to surgeons. And speaking with them, they're all just very amazed at like how I've been able to do it. And I actually got an x-ray a few months ago and he was just amazed. He was like, I don't know how, like, whatever you're doing, keep doing it because my curve has literally stayed the same since I was diagnosed at 13, which is a testimony to, again, movement, I would say, right? I've been moving my body um, and also therapies I've been doing, gyrotonic, uh, scoliosis for yoga, breathing techniques. Sometimes it's as simple as that, as just breathing on a yoga mat. Um, and I think just sharing that with doctors, hopefully will, with the vulnerability we're talking about, will enlighten them to um, see and, and develop different ways to speak to their patients. Because for me and my family, surgery was not an option at 13. And I'm grateful it wasn't, but I know for someone else, it's a dire necessity. Of, of course, I've been intimidating when I've had to speak to doctors because a lot of them are stuck in their ways with that. But I think, again, me sharing my story and being an advocate has allowed them to open their mind a bit more and um, to be curious and, and ask questions as to what is it that you've done to maintain your health. Nina and I are both in the medical world. What, what do we need to know that we should know about dancers, uh, about disabilities that, you know, hasn't yet come across it sufficiently? People in the medical field um, wanting to know things about dancers, how they can help. I feel like as a dancer, we are so connected, in touch with our bodies that I, for me, I know what's wrong with my body more than what a what a medical professional would know because I'm that in tuned with my vessel. I've spent so many years fine tuning myself figuring out what one pain feels like and how I can move my breath. This is a new practice for me, how I can move my breath in that area to heal. And again, um, my physical therapist at work, she always says motion is lotion, you know? So if I have a backache, I need to move. I feel like medical professionals should definitely take a dance class to get out of their head and into their body. Well, I love that phrase, motion is lotion. And I am going to use that with my patients. Um, Nina, I'm going to hand it back to you. You know, tell us a little bit more about how you envision using dance to, to train medical professionals, students, nursing students, and, and what we could be doing. So right now, the course that what I helped develop um, was unfortunately cut short by COVID. Um, it only had a few sessions and then COVID happened and definitely in-person dance with, you know, contact improv was not going to be happening. And the, the, the course was set up in kind of a progression um, that had four parts. Part one was really learning about yourself. Um, so how do you embody different emotions? How do you, um, like if someone says anger, you know, what does that do in you and how do you e express that? Um, you know, you're able to, as a dancer, kind of like just fill everything with a certain energy. Like 
your hand can become like energized in a certain way, like from a certain emotion. And so I was trying to get people who aren't dancers to be able to feel that. Then the second part was transitioning to how other people um, might embody those emotions in ways that you don't. You, that's kind of the, the area where that's your ultimate goal, right? How can you use movement to understand the way that people, patients, colleagues, um, might be like sensing from their, their head to their toes a certain emotion and expressing it. A patient might be doing so silently, you don't even know they're doing it. But how can you pick up on that and kind of start to think about how you can understand the emotion they might be showing you through their bodies? I think that's really fascinating. And I hope that it, it, it comes back once we have the pandemic under control. It makes me think a lot about, you know, how we use literature in medicine and health care. And I often say that our our patients speak to us in metaphor. And our job as clinicians is to unpack our patient's metaphor. They may say, you know, I have this ache over here and that's the metaphor. You know, there might be some disease or some psychological issue that we have to unpack. And I think there are just as many physical metaphors that patients, you know, will have a, a big um, expressing some sort of physical discomfort. And that is a metaphor for what is going on underneath, what disease process, you know, what's going on in their life. and and you know, being in touch with how physical metaphors are manifest is, is quite important. And, and Samantha, your solo was just beautiful. And, and I'm wondering if you could talk to us about how you thought about the poem, how you interpreted with issues of disability and poetry and art, and how you came to the solo that you performed for us. The poem was so amazing. I'm so thankful to have that. And it really resonated with me from the beginning. Um, for me, I sat with the poem for like two days, and I honestly, would I recorded myself saying it and I would put it in my ear pod and walk through the park, walk on my way to work. And for me, the poem has a lot of imagery of the brambles of bare branches and sunset, the sunset and the world. And so, yes, just seeing how my environment, my walk to work was literally within the poem, within the rebirth of the change in season and things, it was just very much in alignment. It was really interesting. It was it was a fun task. It was um, for me challenging myself and questioning myself and asking myself, um, how do, do these words, how do they relate in my life? How do I maybe become the uh, main character in the poem, become that um, person, become that feeling? One of the opening lines was, um, the world is bruised and we hold the world to too uh, close and we end up bruising it, something along that lines. And so just for me, breaking down that one stanza, how, what do I hold on to? What do I, um, what do I cherish? You know, that I can be um, kind of wanting it so badly that I'm damaging it. That at the end of the poem, the person chooses herself or chooses themselves and choosing a positive future. And it was an opportunity for me to put it on the page, leave it on the floor. <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, Paige, I want, I want to give the last word to you. You've now been through this experience working with poets and dancers, sign interpreters, musicians, filmmakers, writers. You, you've had to pull all these different art forms together. And I'm wondering if you can share just something of what you took from that or the experience of that. I had in mind an idea of what I thought I wanted the order to be based on the, the poems and the words. But when I received everyone's footage, it like, I was like, okay, no, it has to be this way. I made a big 360. And it's interesting hearing Sam's um, interpretation about a person who chooses joy and, and just chooses to be in the light. Uh, because my poem, they mention uh, metal. And for me, the thought of metal, I think about if I would have gotten surgery and put steel rods in my spine, where would I be right mm. now? I could have been mm. still dancing, but um, who knows? And so for me, it was, I picked that poem because that word really is a, it's a trigger for me and it's not a negative trigger. It's just something that I often ponder on because I know people who have had that procedure done. So um, also choosing joy and being content in my choice um, as a, an adult and where my path will lead from this point. But in terms of piecing it together, it really was just a matter of 
how each solo kind of sewed in. And I, again, once I got the footage, I was like, ah, I know what I want to do. This is mm. just, it's a book with different chapters. I, I hope everyone takes away that same feeling of life is a journey. Where, where my feet are is where I'm supposed to be in this moment just like we're supposed to be in this panel in this moment. And so that's a wonderful note to end it. We, you know, where your feet are, where our feet are, is where we're supposed to be. Um, mm -hmm. I will show, share a copy of the Bellevue literary review. This is actually our issue called reading the body. In fact, the artwork is featured, um, but scoliosis. Um, and you can, uh, check out BLR on the web, as well as the Paige Fraser Foundation. It's been a wonderful collaboration between two arts organizations. Uh, I want to thank all the dancers, um, the students, um, the poets, the musicians, the videographer, um, as well as our respective boards who've supported us through this. Thank you so much for a wonderful evening and we'll see you at the next event. Good night. <laughs>